so far we have had the opportunity to learn about energy metabolism and how dietary intake of carbohydrates, fats, and proteins are used to produce energy in our body. Uh, this chapter focuses on the macronutrient proteins. Be able to define amino acid, dispensable amino acid, and indispensable amino acid. Also, there is a class of amino acids called conditionally indispensable. See if you can match these four terms to the definitions on the right. In this textbook, the author refers to essential amino acids as indispensable, meaning we can't go without them. There are nine total that are estimated to be indispensable or essential. The dispensable amino acids include 11 amino acids that can be manufactured in the liver. And there are conditionally essential amino acids, also known as conditionally indispensable amino acids. In periods of physiological stress, the body cannot manufacture um, certain amino acids in a sufficient amount. So during extreme stress or even pregnancy, um, some amino acids are needed in greater quantity or become essential or indispensable. The learning objectives here ask you to be familiar with the structure and function of protein, the digestion, absorption, transportation, and metabolism of amino acids, how protein is metabolized, and the processes, the processes that are associated with um, skeletal muscle synthesis and skeletal muscle breakdown. You saw in the chapter on the energy systems that protein can easily be broken down to enter the Krebs cycle to generate energy. Um, be able to explain or recognize the daily protein recommendations for athletes and the timing of protein intake before, during, and after exercise. Um, be able to recognize or describe the effects of low protein and energy take, intakes on training, recovery, performance, and health. Be able to translate protein recommendations. So if you're given a hypothetical person in a quiz, um, be able to calculate protein needs for that individual, and also be able to evaluate dietary supplements containing amino acids and proteins for safety and effectiveness. They're not all created equal. So this is a very interesting chapter. For our bodies to function optimally and for protein to be used most efficiently, we need to make sure we're getting adequate energy from both carbohydrate and fat. Protein is critical during periods of growth and development. You can see the structure of an amino acid, which is the simplest or the breakdown product of proteins. An amino acid will contain what's called an alpha carbon or essential carbon attached to a hydrogen. This is bound to an amino group which contains nitrogen and an acid group, specifically a carboxyl group. The alpha carbon will also be attached to an R group, also known as a side chain. All amino acids have this basic structure. The differences in amino acids come in with changing the R group. You can see a summary of the 20 amino acids classified based on whether they are dispensable, indispensable, or conditionally indispensable in our diet. You can also see whether it is a glucogenic or ketogenic amino acid. Glucogenic amino acids can be used to make glucose. And 
most of the amino acids are glucogenic. Ketogenic amino acids um, are used to make ketones. Ketones are a, an adaptation or a result of fat breakdown when we underconsume calories from carbohydrate. Alanine is an important amino acid that can be produced in the muscle from pyruvate. Remember, pyruvate is formed from the breakdown of glucose or from the breakdown of glycogen. Alanine can be released into the bloodstream and then taken up by the liver where it can be converted back into pyruvate to produce glucose. This comes in handy if we're experiencing starvation. Okay, and we will see this illustrated in a picture later on in the lecture. Glutamine is conditionally indispensable. Glutamine is an important amino acid because it represents about 50% of the amino acids that we have available at any given time and what is called our amino acid pool. Half of it is glutamine. Glutamine is a potent stimulator for our immune system and it fuels our immune system cells. So um, it's important to consume protein every day and uh, we're going to talk about how much protein we actually lose today. Um, branch chain amino acids may be of interest to you if you are an athlete or trying to reduce um, muscle fatigue after a workout. Branch chain amino acids um, like isoleucine can be used as an energy source if you are participating in prolonged endurance exercise or when your muscle glycogen stores are low. Leucine is an indispensable essential amino acid it is not glucogenic, meaning that it cannot be used to produce glucose, um, but it is ketogenic, meaning that it can be used to make ketone bodies, which are the acidic breakdown products of fat. Leucine is a branch chain amino acid, and it can be used during prolonged endurance exercise as an energy source when your muscle glycogen stores drop. Leucine also activates signaling proteins that are needed um, to signal skeletal muscle protein synthesis. Valine is another branch chain amino acid that the muscle can use for energy during prolonged endurance exercises when your glycogen stores get low. This table is from your textbook and it shows the 20 amino acids. Proteins vary in quality. Not all proteins are created equal. Um, while the 20 amino acids are contained in all proteins. The amino acids are not always in the sufficient quantities that the human body needs. So protein quality is based on the amount and the type of amino acids and the, the extent to which they are absorbed. The current international score for protein quality is called Protein Digestibility Corrected Amino Acid Score, abbreviated PDCAAS. Proteins from animal origin are called complete proteins because they contain the non-essential 
or indispensable amino acids needed by the human body. This is because they contain all of the indispensable amino acids and quantities that support growth. The concept of complementary proteins was reviewed in the prerequisite for this class and involves combining different plant foods in order to make a complete protein that has a high PDC AAS score. The protein digestibility corrected amino acid score represents the quality of protein and how easily it is um, absorbed uh, by the human body. A PDC AAS score of one indicates that the human body can use 100% of the amino acids that are contained in that protein source. Um, so casein, which is from milk, it's a slowly absorbed amino acid, or protein, I should say, um, is found in milk. Egg is one of the highest quality proteins you can consume. It is also a very cheap source of protein. Uh, milk proteins contain casein and whey. Whey is uh, absorbed more quickly um, than casein. And whey has a PDC AAS score of one. Um, there are some high quality vegetable source proteins like soy, which has a um, score of 95% or 0.95. Nuts tend to have a high uh, protein digestibility score at 0.7, beans and legumes um, a little lower, 0.6. Um, so the practice of complementary proteins is necessary for people who follow ve vegan or vegetarian diets. If you're not consuming meat or meat products, it's important to combine different food groups like a legume like a bean with a grain, like brown rice, to make sure that that meal has sufficient amino acids. This slide asks you to match the terms peptide, dipeptide, tripeptide, and polypeptide with um, how that they are best defined. A uh, peptide is best defined as two or more amino acids that are linked by peptide bonds. Um, peptides can be differentiated as di, tri, or polypeptides. A dipeptide is a peptide that includes a linkage between two amino acids. A tripeptide is made up of three amino acids and a polypeptide is made up of four or more amino acids, usually hundreds that are linked by peptide bonds. Polypeptides in the human body are synthesized by a structure in our cells called the ribosomes. Be able to differentiate the, between or among the primary, secondary, tertiary, and quaternary structure of proteins or polypeptides. The primary structure of a protein is based on DNA and RNA, which determine the type, the number, and the sequence of amino acids included in a polypeptide. The secondary structure of a polypeptide is a result of bonding of amino acids that are located close to one another. And the tertiary structure is responsible for bonding of amino acids that are distant from one another. Amino acids have various charges. Some are positive, some are negative, some have a neutral charge, and so they will repel and attract accordingly. 
So number two, the shape of a protein, for example, how straight coiled or folded it is, is a result of its secondary structure. While the tertiary structure is responsible for interactions of amino acids that are located farther away from one another. Number three, it is quaternary structure that involves more than one polypeptide. Typically two or four polypeptides. Within the hemoglobin molecule, there are four polypeptides that make up hemoglobin. The adult human body uh, will turn over about 300 grams of protein a day. It is estimated one to two percent of total protein in the body is degraded on a daily basis. Twenty percent of degraded protein will be used um, to yield nitrogen and carbon skeletons that can be used to make other compounds. So it is important to consume protein on a regular basis throughout the day to account for this fact. The body proteins are often categorized into five major categories. The enzymes, or as a component of enzymes, hormones that function as signal signalers, uh, structural proteins like our fingernails and whatnot, our bones are structural proteins. Transport proteins include um, LDLs or our low density lipoproteins. There are also proteins that function as gateways within cell membranes. Our immune system proteins are needed to fight disease that may, we may encounter. So a summary of the functions of proteins in the human body is included in your chapter and within this lecture. Um, in addition to the functions that were on the previous slide, proteins function in acid-base balance and help to keep bodily fluids within their optimal pH ranges. Proteins also act as a fluid regulator. They help compartmentalize fluids into the spaces they're supposed to be in. For example, we have intravascular fluid, which is the fluid contained within our vascular spaces, intracellular fluid, which is with the fluid within our cells and interstitial fluid, which is the fluid outside of our cells. Whenever our protein levels drop enough, fluid starts to spill into our interstitial spaces causing swelling called edema. Usually, um, only a small percent of protein is used for energy in the human body. Less than 5% of protein that we consume is used for energy under normal circumstances. However, um, an exercise in muscle um, does or is capable of using available amino acids for energy. If you recall from the previous chapter, um, or I should say chapter three on energy systems, there are many points at which amino acids can enter the Krebs cycle to yield ATP. Protein digestion and absorption is discussed in this chapter. Our dietary proteins uh, are subjected to the action of hydrochloric acid in the stomach 
and the enzyme pepsin, which begins the breakdown of our dietary proteins. The small intestine is where most protein digestion and absorption takes place. The pancreas secretes trypsin into the small intestine, which helps breaks large polypeptides into amino acids and small polypeptides, which are di and tripeptides. There are enzymes on the brush border in the lumen of the small intestine that also function to break down polypeptides into smaller peptides. Um, Amino acids can be absorbed directly into the bloodstream, and there are some proteins that are absorbed into the lymphatic system, um, some absorbed as part of um, the chylomicron, which helps transport fat in the body. As we'll see in the picture on the left side, the liver is the clearing house for amino acids. It is responsible for monitoring the amino acid pool, how much is available, and for transporting amino acids to the appropriate tissues. Um, the liver um, has less ability to process the branch chain amino acids, however, the muscle cells actually have more of the enzyme BCAA transferase that is able to um, metabolize um, these types of amino acids, which include valine, isoleucine, and leucine. After we eat a protein-containing meal, it is important to note that um, the amino acid concentration will remain elevated for several hours. Okay. The amino acid pool is discussed in your textbook. It refers to the average number of amino acids that are available um, within our blood and lymphatic tissues. There are free amino acids that are circulating. On average, about 150 grams of amino acids are available. The amino acid glutamine makes up about half or over half. If we have 150, about 80 grams is glutamine. In the picture or figure on um, page 157, we see the sources of amino acids, which can include our dietary protein or protein supplements. These are exogenous sources or endogenous sources, which can include dead mucosal cells, enzymes, and other protein-containing secretions. The liver is responsible for processing most of our amino acids. The branch chain amino acids are best processed or broken down by the skeletal muscle. The skeletal muscle has a higher number of branch chain amino acid enzymes that are available to break down the branch chain amino acids, valine, isoleucine, and leucine. The liver and its breakdown of um, amino acids produces ammonia which is toxic to our tissues. So it must be converted into urea where it is routed to our kidneys so it can be excreted as urine. Other ways that we can use, um, lose nitrogen include um, nitrogen losses in sweat and nitrogen losses in fecal matter. Be familiar with the terms anabolic, catabolic, transamination, and deamination. You can use this slide as a way to practice. See if you can match these terms with the definitions on the right.
this is an example of deamination of the amino acid threonine. Threonine is an essential, indispensable amino acid that when it's deaminated produces water, ammonium, and an alpha keto acid. In this case, the alpha keto acid that is produced is alpha keto butyrate. The amino acid pool that is available in our muscle tissue is derived from uptaking amino acids from um, amino acids available in the blood. Um, there is a de novo synthesis of proteins that can occur from the amino acids present in muscle. De novo means it occurs within the muscle. There are amino acids. Uh, that can also be metabolized via oxidative phosphorylation to produce ATP for energy. Amino acids can be used to produce ATP in oxidative phosphorylation. There are a number of entry points for amino acid in the Krebs cycle, um, pyruvate can also be made from a number of amino acids. The entry point of the amino acid is determined by the structure of the amino acid, or its R group. See if you can select the incorrect answer of the four following statements. Is it A, ammonia is produced as a result of amino acid catabolism? Is it B, ammonia is converted to urea in the kidneys via the urea cycle? Ammonia is toxic to the body. Small amounts of nitrogen are lost daily via urine. The answer is B. Ammonia is converted to urea in the liver. Protein is metabolized during endurance exercise and whenever our glucose gets low, um, the body specifically the muscle, can use pyruvate to form the amino acid alanine in a reaction in which glutamate is deaminated into the alpha keto acid, alpha keto glutarate. Alanine is sent out into the bloodstream and then taken up by the liver, which there it is converted back into pyruvate in transamination glutamate is reformed and then broken down into ammonium then converted into urea the alanine is used to make pyruvate and in a process called gluconeogenesis Glucose can be produced, sent back into the bloodstream, and circulated to different cells that require glucose. So muscle um, glycogen can be broken down, converted into alanine, sent into the bloodstream, and then sent to the liver where it can be used to make glucose for other tissues. When we talk about nitrogen balance, we talk about the difference between the total nitrogen, which correlates with protein, 5 grams of nitrogen is equivalent to about 30 grams of protein, and total nitrogen loss. So we look at intake and loss. Additionally, protein turnover and net protein balance must be considered. Net protein balance involves muscle protein synthesis and breakdown. 
we have positive nitrogen balance when our muscle protein synthesis is greater than our muscle protein breakdown during pregnancy growth and in athletes trying to increase muscle mass the increase in muscle mass we refer to as hypertrophy are examples of positive nitrogen balance there are certain disease states that can put an individual in negative nitrogen balance uh, for someone who is trying to increase muscle mass positive nitrogen balance must be attained in order to increase muscle protein synthesis examples of daily protein recommendations which is one of your objectives for this chapter are illustrated here um, the maximum amount of protein that is recommended for anybody is 2.5 grams for every kilogram of body weight. The RDA for protein, a recommended dietary allowance for protein, is 0 0.8 grams for every kilogram of body weight per day. A recreational athlete is someone who can stand an increase in protein from 0.8 grams to 1 gram for every kilogram of body weight per day. For someone training as a middle distance runner, um, in order to account for the intensity of training, protein needs may um, range from 1.2 to 1.5 grams for every kilogram of body weight per day. For those who are um, athletes in active muscle building phase, in conjunction with a resistance program, these athletes can ingest two grams of protein for every kilogram of body weight per day in order to increase skeletal muscle mass. An athlete who is returning to muscle maintenance after an increase in skeletal muscle mass can return uh, from a two gram per kilogram per body weight per day protein level to a 1.5 gram per kilogram body weight per day protein level to maintain muscle. Ultra endurance athletes, if you're training for the Olympics, um, should adjust protein intakes to reflect rest, low volume, and high volume endurance training phases. The precise amount of protein that's needed by athletes in training is not known, okay? The precise amount, so recommendations and ranges are given. Um, protein recommendations for athletes will fall between 1.2 to 2 grams of protein for every kilogram of body weight per day. Um, and these recommendations hold provided that um, that individual or athlete is giving, getting adequate calories and getting quality protein. You can maximize the amount of skeletal muscle growth that occurs or maximize muscle protein synthesis. Uh, consume the recommended amount of protein within two hours of exercise, preferably with, within one hour, but definitely within two hours, consume 0.25 to 0.3 grams of protein for every kilogram of body weight. This usually translates to about 15 to 20 grams of protein within one to two hours of exercise. Uh, large body strength athletes um, may need 30 to 40 grams after exercise. Um, if you're looking for uh, protein recommendations throughout the day, um, you can consume 25 to 35 grams of protein per meal every three to five hours while you are awake okay um, it's important to space out protein throughout the day however most americans consume about 60 percent of protein 
at their evening meal. Whenever you put your body through exercise, this actually induces a temporary catabolic state in which the body is breaking down. Um, this is fo followed by what's called an anabolic window. This window is what allows for recovery from the acute effects of exercise and allows for optimal muscle protein synthesis, also known as skeletal muscle growth. All right. Um, quality protein needs to be consumed, whether it's from a meat source like egg white, whey or casein, which can come as a supplement or um, are naturally found in milk or soy or high quality proteins can be uh, made by com combining complementary proteins such as legumes with grains, a legume like a bean with the grain like brown rice makes a higher quality protein, okay? Looking at these two questions, um, carbohydrates stimulate the release of insulin. This helps us to restore our muscle glycogen. Insulin is a hormone that is released from the pancreas in response to carbohydrate ingestion. Two effects of insulin on amino acids and muscle include increasing amino acid uptake. Insulin tells your body to store not only glucose, but amino acids. And insulin can inhibit muscle degradation. So in addition to consuming um, the requisite protein within one hour, preferably, of working out, it's important to consume carbohydrate to replenish glycogen. This is going to maximize muscle protein synthesis. Excess protein is defined as greater than two grams per kilogram body weight per day and is associated with uh, some deleterious effects such as dehydration. Also, protein can crowd out carbohydrates. Dehydration can rob performance. Low carbohydrate intake also robs performance. Excess protein intake is also associated with excess caloric intake and in the United States is associated with increased intake of saturated fats. There are some athletes that underconsume calories and protein and in turn have long-term substantial energy deficits. Um, athletes who participate in sports that require subjective judging like gymnastics or dance are tend, uh, tend to have higher rates of disorder eating patterns or e eating disorders. They are most at risk for under-consuming energy and protein. It is important to consume adequate calories to optimize performance and for people who have been under-consuming calories to increase protein intake to meet needs. If you restrict energy and restrict protein while you're training or while you are increasing your physical activity, then it can lead to uh, daily energy deficits um, and loss of lean body mass. If you're following a low calorie diet, this is going to increase the amount of protein that you need to sustain your lean mass. It is recommended that people on low calorie diets get at least 1.8 grams of protein for every kilogram of body weight to sustain lean body mass. If you fast to make weight, um, it can be dangerous. 
it can result in um, loss of substantial water and possibly electrolyte imbalances, sodium or potassium imbalances. Some athletes participate in intermittent fasting uh, for religious reasons. In cases where calories are being under-consumed, um, your book suggests moving workout times to accommodate for the times which, in which a person is fasting. Um, your immune system function can decrease a little bit after you work out, but immune system function returns the next day if you however are not replenishing your calories and protein then your immune system will suffer and you can have a chronically low immune system and it can be a um, chronic problem vegetarian and vegan diets can support athletic performance. Um, they are associated with reduced risk of cardiovascular disease and a longer lifespan. A vegan diet is the most restrictive diet and um, eliminates all animal sourced products. The idea of complementary proteins allows the combination of legumes and grains, for example, to create a meal or dish that is adequate in the essential indispensable amino acids. Um, your textbook spotlights a cross country runner who has done a 24 hour diet analysis. Um, Luca outlines his energy carbohydrate protein goals, protein distribution, which refers to how protein will be distributed about across the day. We talked about the recommendation of 15 to 25 grams of post-exercise protein and 15 to 25 grams every three to five hours while awake. And goals for fat are also outlined. This is a good way to keep track of intake and whether you are meeting your goals. Protein supplements, they are heavily advertised, um, can be expensive when you compare it to the price of an egg, which has a um, PDC AAS score of one. Um, can be very expensive, but yet they are highly marketed and um, highly profitable. We need to be aware of um, what we are consuming and how much we're paying for it. Um, whey protein is a rapidly absorbed protein that is contained in a lot of post-exercise workout supplements. Your textbook lists a number of different protein supplements and their nutrient content. Supplementation with amino acids will raise the concentration of that amino acid above the normal level. Okay, um, and you can buy almost any amino acid you want over the counter at um, Walmart. There are safe levels of amino acids um, that are recommended. They appear to be safe. However, the effectiveness uh, comes into question in many cases. Um, amino acid supplementation is a, an ongoing area of exercise and diet research. There are a number of supplements that you can buy. Um, some of them can be effective. Beta alanine is an example of a supplement that may be effective in buffering muscle pH in 
athletes who perform high intensity exercise that lasts between one to four minutes. So sprinting would be an example or hurdling. HMB or beta hydroxy beta methyl butyrate is a supplement that has small to very small increases in upper body strength. Um, there is ongoing evidence on HMB. Branch chain amino acids, these as supplements have not been shown in research to be effective at improving performance. However, research studies have shown promise for immune system support with the branched amino branch chain amino acids and the reduction of post-exercise fatigue. Glucosamine and chondroitin is touted as um, a joint pain reliever and inflammation reducer. Uh, some people respond to it um, and you know it helps some individuals. However, in research, it has not been shown to help people who have osteoarthritis, which is an advanced form of arthritis. Um, glutamine has not been shown to be effective, although it's safe. Um, growth hormone releasers like the amino acid arginine can be counterproductive and have actually been shown to decrease the effectiveness of exercise in stimulating growth hormone. Nitric oxide and arginine alpha ketoglutarate have been studied, um, but the effectiveness have, has not been uh, shown due to lack of research. Beta alanine, which we looked at, is a dispensable amino acid that is found in protein containing foods. Supplementation with beta alanine may improve performance for specific exercises. And in the, the case of HMB, it is a metabolite of leucine. Leucine is an amino acid that we actually seem to need more of um, during exercise. Leucine is an essential, indispensable amino acid and also a branch chain amino acid. The branch chain amino acids, be able to list them. They include leucine, isoleucine, and valine. During prolonged endurance exercise, branch chain amino acids can be metabolized for energy when glycogen stores become low. Research has not shown, however, branch chain amino acids to delay fatigue or improve endurance. However, branch chain amino acid supplementation may play an important role in supporting, supporting immune health. The usual recommended dose that appears to be safe is five to 20 grams per day. So if you're taking branch chain amino acid, make sure that they are, uh, fall within um, these ranges and you're not exceeding Glutamine is an amino acid that the body can make. It is dispensable and therefore non-essential. Endurance exercise is a physiological stress and glutamine has been shown to reduce glutamine levels. Glutamine is needed for immune system function and is an important fuel for our immune cells. The dietary intake that is estimated to be safe is three to six grams per day. Glucosamine is touted as a joint lubricant and is sold in combination with chondroitin. Um, it is safe and some individuals have said that it is effective 
and helping to relieve joint pain. Okay, here is a summary of some of the main points in this lecture. Um, I would like to highlight that most athletes can meet their protein needs from food alone. Um, take a look at the table in your chapter that contains selected foods and their protein digested directed amino acid score. Let me know if you have questions.